All right, so today we're going to talk about dreams, how they can be useful, um, and what they actually are, like fundamentally. And I think a, a fun way to phrase this would be, let's say you are a designer of a, you know, an organism or a mind, right? You're, it's a you're designing a cognitive agential system. Why would you put a dream state into there? And would it be during a sleep state, a waking state, somewhere in between? Why would you do it? So I think my, my answer to that question would be that it's essentially a self-induced way uh, it's it's a self-induced way of inducing generalization, right? Because what, what a dream is, because of how discontinuous and how unconventional the logic that, that forms a dream, you know, how it can usually be, um, you'd basically be having a stress test for your memory, for your, you know, previous attentional states that were stored. And then now you're trying to figure out how do you actually store something? And part of the way that you store something is is what do you define it as? Now, again, now this goes back to the idea of language and synesthesia and, and, all, and all that type of stuff, right? And so, if, you know, in order to define what you're, how you're actually storing that memory, you have to generalize it. You have to say, in accordance to what context is this thing even defined, right, and differentiated. And, you know, if you have a very, very literal interpretation of your memory, then it's only going to have a certain level of uses, right? Like, if you have a very, very constrained tool or something, like it's the idea if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, well, then it's very limited. It's going to be useful for that very, very specific thing under that given context, but then it's going to lose all its other uses unless you switch those contexts and you generalize it, right? So an analogy I can give to that, there's actually a couple. Uh, the first one would be um, if you think about like a factory, right? Let's say, you know, and then again, this is analogous to the memories and, and language thing, right? So let's just say you have a factory um, and I want to make only a couple of cars. It's just one, you know, two types of cars and maybe I'm only going to make a couple of them. Well, you don't really need to have that ro robust of a general um, factory toolkit to make those things, right? Because you're only making a couple, there's limitations in space and time for it. You don't really have a, you need to have a reason to maintain some you know, factory continuity across a large period of time. It's like, all right, we'll just get the job done and get it going. But now let's say you wanna make different cars, different trucks, vans, boats, whatever. Um, and you want to make them not only a ton of them in space, different kinds, but then also across time for a long time. Well, in that case, you want something more generalized, which could also be analogous to the way our body functions as a mind, in a sense, as this more generalized factory or, or toolkit. And then the other analogy I can give you would be Play-Doh. So I think it helps to think of this Play-Doh thing in terms of how it relates to something like a Lego brick, in terms of its combinatorial uh, space of, of things it could you know, form into. Um, you know, if you have a Lego brick, if you only have, you know, four slots or, or, or bricks, right, studs, there's only, there's only so many different ways that can form some shape or structure. Now, if you increase the dots on there, so in, in another example, this would be like increasing the polygon off an object inside of a video game or a CAD software or something. And if you do this enough, you add more and more studs or, or polygons or whatever, you basically get something that looks like Play-Doh. Like it, it has so many different things that it could be that it actually has trouble even defining itself. And, and I think in a lot of ways, biology really exceeds at this, types of at this type of functionality. And in this case, our minds, right, our, our brains. And if you think about this in terms of memory, well, if you have too strong of a dream, your memories may end up being useless because they're just so overgeneralized that they could apply to anything. And then if you could be anything, what would you be? So you need to have this sort of sweet zone, this 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 the sweet spot, this Goldilocks zone, of the right amount of generality and specificity, so that your memories actually have some usefulness to them. Um, and you know this is also why I think like psychedelic states or particularly um, you know advanced, deep, powerful um, meditative states are similar, right? Because a lot of the times when you get really deep into something like that, like you are forgetting context, right? You're you're there's such a focus on something that everything else sort of shifts around in a way. Um, and so I think it's really interesting to think about how we can utilize the dreaming state for creative thinking and for potentially you know, significantly improving our problem solving abilities. And so even in my case, the, the dreaming state, this ability to be aware while I'm dreaming and sleeping has, has been so helpful because like even this idea for the old factory language, like a good chunk of that came out of when I was dreaming. Right? And I was just, it was just so much easier to just mix things around. It's almost like a blender. Um, it's really interesting. And I think if more people were able to train on this, um, 
we'd probably be a much more productive and thoughtful society. So I'm going to talk about this, how to actually do this, um, in maybe the next episode or the one after.